Hello, my friends. Now, that is better. Um, <laughs> I'm just waiting for some more people to log on. Hello, my friends. Apologies for this slight hiccup just at the start there, but I couldn't see the chat box, and I need to see the chat box because you need to be able to ask questions. That's the whole point of this. So welcome to Pram Strings. I'm Henriette. I'm the owner and founder of Pram Strings, and I make all these videos for you. So it's lovely to see that people have found us again. Apologies once again for the little mishap at the start, but I wasn't able to see the chat box. And I want you to be able to see the chat box because that is how we can communicate. So this se session is called Henriette Goes Live. Ask any violin related questions. And I'll just run you through how this works before we get started properly. Um, so welcome if you're just tuning in. Um, if you have a look on the right hand side of your screen, there is a chat box and you can see your own profile there and the word say something. Now, I would love you to say something just to test this out. And perhaps you can let me know where you are. So I'm Henriette. I'm in Norwich in the UK. I'm just writing that in the chat box right now. Norwich, UK. And then I hit send and you can perhaps hopefully see that I've written it in there. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, that'd be lovely. Um, last time when we did this live chat, we had people from all over the world um, showing up and that is really nice. Hey, Tommy Matthews, I can see that you are here from Birmingham, welcome. So if anyone else is here right now, do please write in the chat box because this is how you can ask your questions. Now, you can also see if you have a look underneath your own profile in the, in the chat box, you can see this smiley face icon. And if you fancy, you can um, send a sticker. And these are paid stickers. So you can say, um, I'm going to give you a smiley face or a sweetie or a flower, whatever you like. You can add those to your chats if you like. Hello, Susmita. Um, welcome to this class. And if you have another look underneath where you can add your chats, you can see that little dollar sign and you can actually buy a super sticker or a super chat. And that is a paid service that YouTube arranges. However, if you want to support this channel, you can do that in different ways as well. Um, just go on PayPal and support this channel by sending your donation to info at proamstrings.com. And you can also look at the YouTube uh, banner art, like at the, at the home screen of my YouTube channel. There is a direct link there. So that is not my main objective, but there you go. If you want to support this channel, which allows me to do more, make more videos and do more of these live chats, please go ahead and support this channel. So if you have a question, please write it in the chat box right now and we can get started. So it's lovely to see you here today. I'm just waiting a moment for the first questions to come through. And while I, while I do that, some people in recent weeks have written below their videos that they've been watching some questions there. So I will start uh, answering those questions, first of all, in case those people are right here. I can see that there are a lot of people here. So welcome if you've just joined us and apologies for the delay in getting this started. Now, someone asked me, oh, this is a good question. Someone is just popping in a question, just wondering how tight is tight enough for a bow? So that's a lovely question. Thank you, Tommy Matthews, for sending that question. I will show you. Let me just get my bow. And you know that uh, when you play with your bow, you need to loosen it after playing. So when you get it from your case, it probably looks like that, like completely loose. And then I'm tightening the bow and then it is ready for playing. We need to get a little bit of tension in that bow hair. And I usually say if you fit your, your index finger in between the stick and the hair, at its narrowest part, that is tight enough for playing. Obviously, if you are a more advanced player, then for certain bow strokes, you might tighten your bow a little bit 
tighter. Uh, but for general use, I'd say about a finger width space between the stick and the hair. I hope that answers your question. Now, why do we loosen the bow at the end of our playing? And the, the reason for that is that this bow hair is made from horse hair um, and that has a natural elasticity. And if you leave your bow tight all the time, that extra elasticity will wear off after a while. So that's why we loosen the bow when we don't use it. So when you keep it in your case, loosen it a little bit so you keep the spring in your bone. That's much better. <laughs> when you are first learning the violin, thank you for this question by another person. Uh, the question is, I'm studying violin for the first time. What do I do? I would say log on to my latest course, which started about, I don't know, 10 days ago maybe now. It's called Violin Class for Beginners, and it uses the Crickbone method. So you can buy the book and join in with that course uh, and it, I will take you through right from the very start of playing the violin. There is also another course on my channel which is for complete beginners and that I released uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, I can't remember. It's called Suzuki Violin Course Book One and that course uses the Suzuki method for playing. So if you fancy that or you don't know what to do, uh, you can choose either. OK. All right. Now, then, somebody else uh, asked me about an exercise for the independence of the fingers. Obviously, when you're a little bit more advanced and you use all the fingers on your violin, I'm just going to get my violin now. Um, we want to get used to playing with more independent fingering and a good exercise for that is just this tapping exercise so if this is you ask this question might well be um because it's a good one and it's a very useful exercise even uh, at every level of playing pop your first finger on the a string then pretend that your middle finger has got a little rubber band here stringing it on that side and I'm lifting my fingers up by tightening this rubber band and then if you imagine you let this go and you come down on the string you start to tap your finger on the string so when you play your fingers it's actually lifting up by pulling on your muscles here at the back and then letting them go and it springs back and an exercise for independence of fingering is just this tapping it and you can perhaps hear the rattling of my finger on the fingerboard can you hear that and now once you've done that a couple of times try it with your third finger really imagining lifting it up and then letting it spring back onto the strings so there you go you can do that and same with your pinky lift it up from the bass knuckle right here ping it back like that and that's a very good exercise for independence of your fingers. So if this person that happened to ask this question in one of my latest videos happens to be here, I hope that helps. If you're here and you want to know more about independence of fingerings, do write it in the chat box there. Your Suzuki book videos really help my progress. Oh, that's really sweet of you. Thank you very much for uh, telling me that. You see, I enjoy making these videos for people like you, who I don't know, sadly, um, and people give me lots of lovely feedback. So I'm glad that I can help. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're enjoying learning with me. And that's the whole point. I just want to make uh, access to learning to play the violin as easy as possible for people. So... Uh, in another video, someone has asked me the question, this is about vibrato practice. You may know vibrato is that wiggling of your arm. And this person has asked me, um, my thumb keeps moving when I play vibrato, uh, whereas mine doesn't. You see there? Now, if you're in the early stages of learning to play with vibrato and your thumb wriggles a little bit up and down and up and down, can you see your thumb comes with you there? 
that is perfectly fine. Uh, and that allows your finger, and that allows your finger to, um, and that allow, sorry, I'm a bit distracted because some, something is pinging. And um, when you play vibrato, it, and your thumb is loose, it allows your, your movement, your vibrato to move. Now, when you're a little bit further advanced, you can do this with less effort. And that's the time when you can lightly lay your finger there, your thumb there, and let it move gradually less. So I wouldn't worry at all about your thumb moving initially when you first learn vibrato. But then once you're a little bit further advanced and your muscle groups here have developed a little bit more, so you become a little bit stronger, then you can perhaps get used to letting your thumb be there. But you can probably see my thumb is ultra loose. It's not squeezing because if I squeeze my thumb, I, it will be much harder to move the vibrato, you see. So if you happen to be here and ask this question, I hope this helps. Let me see if there's any other questions. Now, another question that somebody asked me, and this is a very common occurrence uh, when you bow, and this happens especially when you are a slightly older learner or when you are uh, a new beginner, that happens quite a lot, that the bow, you'll find the bow bounces. Now, the bow is naturally very stretchy. And you can perhaps gently manipulate your bow like that, and you can see that it has some movement. And it's made to be bouncy like that, but if there is a lot of tension in your upper arm and in your shoulder in particular, it may bounce at moments where you don't want it. Now, I shall not play because I have I have the experience that when I play in a live session, it doesn't sound too good. But I can show you what happens. It especially happens on the upper middle section of the bow so about this area when you play and your bow suddenly you hit that spot and your bow starts to bounce like that now a, a, there is a simple exercise that you can do it doesn't give you instant results i'm afraid uh, but over time that will get better when that happens and you find your bow bouncing here i want you to stop bowing and try to drop your shoulder and drop your elbow and then continue your bow stroke like that and you might try it again bow until you hit the bouncy bit here stop the bow consciously relax your shoulder and your elbow and your upper arm and hopefully that will be a bit less and then continue your bow stroke now on your third bow stroke when you're practicing this Try to anticipate where your bow might bounce and you might already, as you are playing, drop your shoulder and drop your elbow so that you play with the slightly more relaxed bow arm. And hopefully that will over time allow you to play with slightly more weight into the bow and therefore less bounce. There we are. Now, uh, sorry, my computer is playing up. There we go. All right. Now, have we got any new questions? I've got another question that has come in um, after one of the videos that somebody's followed. And this was a video about the bow hold and about wanting to bend your little finger. Now, you may know that a good bow hold has got a bent thumb here and also a bent little finger. Now, when you're first learning to play the violin, bending this little finger is extremely difficult. Of course, that's what we're aiming to do, but please don't worry if you can't get it to bend when you're in the early stages of your learning. What needs to happen and what does happen with every single player is that your muscles of your little finger and especially the muscles here on the side of your hand will grow stronger. And once your muscles are strong enough, you will be able to manipulate the, your little finger like that. Okay. Um, if it doesn't bend just now, it doesn't matter. 
you will do lots of bow exercises and I'll show you some bow exercises. For those of you who got their instruments out and their bows out, please practice it with me. So you want to start on a good bow hold with your thumb bent underneath, your middle finger opposite your thumb, and then you have a space here between your index finger and your middle finger and also space between your ring finger and your little finger. And now we want to do some waves with your bow. So you go up and down, like that. And that helps develop flexibility in your wrist. But not only that, it also helps develop the muscle here at the side of your right hand. Now, let's do this windscreen wiper exercise <clears throat> and when you do this I want you to feel the shift in balance that when I tip the point over this way my pinky is carrying more of the bow because it hinges on my thumb can you see that and when you go and tip it over the other side you hold the weight of the bow with your index finger here and it's that slight change in weight distribution of the bow between your little finger when your point is to your left side and your index finger when your bow tips over your windscreen wiper tips over the other way that is what makes your muscles grow here what makes you stronger in your little finger and when that is strong enough you can see i can manipulate my bow like this between my fingers and then that's when you get strong enough to be able to do that. Now, when we hold a bow, this is an interesting one perhaps, this ring between your thumb and your middle finger, that's the only way that you hold the bow up. Don't forget that your bow will be resting on your strings as well. So your middle finger and your thumb, that is the part of your hand that holds the bow up and it stops it from falling on the floor. All your other fingers are there and in this particular bow hold to manipulate the bow. Look, I can move the point sideways by straightening my little finger and by sort of crisscrossing it between my index finger and my little finger. Then I can move the bow up and down by balancing, seesawing almost my bow over my thumb. You see, my thumb is still bent underneath. And then as a third different movement, I can roll the bow between my fingers. So I can choose to play more on the side of the hair, on that side, or flatter with all the hair on the string, or more on the side of this hair, you see? So three different ways in which you can manipulate the bow. You can move it up and down like that. You can move it forwards or backwards like that. So you can ch change the the distance to the bridge or to the fingerboard by manipulating your bow sideways and you can roll it between your fingers so that you play on more hair or less hair so that's why we have this really intricate bow hold <laughs> to be able to do all of that now if you're a beginner please don't even try these things because that is a bit too difficult develop your bow hold first and then once you are a more established player and your muscles have got really used to this and you can play with a very, fairly flat hand like that then you can start to roll the bow between your fingers and do all the other things so another question has just come in i actually find it hard to always keep my pinky on the bow when on my string it's like floating yes oh that's a very good question thank you uh, for the person who just uh, asked this question the idea is that, um, the question is that I'm losing my pinky off the bow. I can't reach it. That's weird, isn't it? Now, and that has something to do with the balance of your hand. So if your pinky can't quite reach it, you might put your middle two fingers, these two, further over the bow. Uh, and that makes your index finger bend a little bit more. You see, if my fingers are more straight like that, can you see that? then I can't reach it with my pinky because it is simply too short, as you say. Now, look what happens if I move my middle two fingers further over the bow. Suddenly, my fingers are much more bent, and I, I've talked about this little claw-like shape quite a lot in my videos. Um, and when you've got your fingers further over your bow, you suddenly find that your pinky can reach the side edge. 
Now, some people make a habit of playing their pinky on the top of the bow, which then limits your, your um, manipulation opportunities of the bow, so you can't, you can't steer it as well. Uh, so if you once you get your fingers to go further over, you will be able to reach it with your pinky, and then you've got later on those opportunities again. So it's not wrong, it's just a part of your development. Thank you for that question, it's a good one. I like talking about the bow. Is there anything else that someone wants to know? Oh, thank you. Uh, Deborah asked me another question. Thank you for your question, Deborah. Is there a better way to approach the G-string to get a clearer sound? Now, that is a very, very good question uh, because the G-string, when you look at your strings, G-string is one of your thicker strings uh, and it sometimes needs a bit more manipulating to actually get the full sound. So what you can do is a couple of things. First of all, we talked about the bow, that rolling of the bow, can you remember? First of all, you might try and check that your bow hair is flat on the strings because this string is much thicker. Um, I need to catch it much better with my bow to get a good grip on it, if you like. So if you find yourself playing, especially on this side of the bow, which I would always discourage, or that side of the bow, Try to play with a flatter bow so you've got more possibility to, to draw the sound out of your string, as it were. Uh, because that is, we, we're looking for this friction of the bow on the string, can you see? Uh, and the more friction you can create, the better sound you will get. So that's one solution that you may try. Is, there, is my hair flat on the string? Something else that you might think, uh, that you might check, is, is my bow perfectly straight along the bridge? Now, I see this quite a lot. Uh, I see this occasionally. What you might see is, can you get your bow to go parallel to the bridge? Because when your bow gets parallel to the bridge, you, get, you can create, again, more friction. Okay, and you can play the bow parallel to the bridge by stretching your bow arm forwards. We always think that bowing goes like this, though, don't we? We think there, I'm bowing like that. But actually, bowing is more like that. So you go forwards with your arm rather than sideways. So if you find that you're at an angle, you, your G string won't sound really good because you're not, again, creating that friction enough to get the fullest quality sound. Now, then there is something else that you might consider, and I'm trying to sort of brainstorm on possible ways why your G-string might not sound as well, um, is that maybe you're using too little bow. Uh, because we get our sound by having the correct, um, the correct level of speed compared to the pressure of the bow. So it may well be if your bow doesn't really get that sound from the G-string, that your sound is, that your speed is too slow. Uh, so you want to increase the length of your bow so that it travels faster if you use longer bows. So that is the most common issue. Uh, very rarely it happens that people go too fast with their bows, but that doesn't happen that often, you see. What I see every day is that people use shorter bows rather than longer ones. And you might just practice using the whole bow from the point to the heel and play it fairly fast. And that way, if, you, if your bow goes at greater speed across the strings, uh, you will be able to lean into it, so get a bit more weight into the string for a fuller sound. Now, this is an interesting idea, this weight into the string. If you followed my videos, you will have seen that I'm always promoting keeping your shoulder down and you pretend you're hanging off the string with your bow rather than getting the weight by pushing the bow into the string. This never gives a good sound and most violins just don't like it and they play up when you do that. So there is a very big difference between getting the weight because you're forcing the weight into the string rather than you let the, the weight of your arm and your hand hang off the string. 
Now that's not so easy to to realize when you play is that this hangs off the string. You can test it in the easiest way on the G string rather than on the E string because the whole angle is different. Uh, but you might try and see, can I hang off the string with my whole arm and let all the weight of my arm, I've always got this morbid thought that I would want to know how heavy an arm is. If you chopped an arm off, how much would it weigh? And I imagine it might weigh maybe two kilos. I don't know. Never tried that one. <laughs> okay, so you might want to hang off this string with all that weight of your arm and in that way create the sound. I hope that answers your question. And I'm hoping most of all that it gives you ideas to experiment because after all, every violin and every bow is slightly different from the next one. It's not a standardized product. So I can't say you need half a kilo of weight into the string and the speed of X. Uh, it's all very different from one violin to the next. So just experiment being lighter and being heavier on the bow. Let me see if there's another question. Ah, here is another very good one. Any ideas on how to improve intonation with the third finger? I tend to play flat, particularly when playing a descending scale. Thank you, Linda, for that question. It's a good one. Very, very common issue. So I'd like to address that as well here in this class. Now, the third finger, when it is flat, I'll show you something. Um, let me see how I can best address that. Look what happens to my fingers if I'll start in the correct position like this with my wrist this way. So I'm, I'm making sure that I'm not leaning against the violin with my wrist here, okay? And that brings my fingers on their fingertips. Now, what happens sometimes when people play the violin is this comes that way, and look what it does to my fingertips. It pulls my fingertips away from the strings. I need them on the strings, but by getting your wrist to go like this, and I'm not saying this is you because I don't know you, uh, okay? Um, what you might try this is, is moving your wrist that way. You can very clearly see here how that brings my third finger closer to the strings. Can you see that? Now, especially when you play descending scale, I imagine that your fourth finger is then on the string and a fourth finger encourages you to play with more space here. But as soon as you take that fourth finger away, if that happens, then yes, you play with a flat fourth a flat third finger, I beg your pardon. So what you might try in the first instance is to see if you can work on your wrist because that encourages your third finger to go a little bit higher. Okay, what I'd also like you to check over is that your fingers are high up above this fingerboard. Now, this ridge of knuckles needs to be level with your E string. That is why in my courses, and I've just recorded one of the courses today, so I've still got it on my finger, um, we have a finger line here. Just where my index finger is connected to my hand, that finger line here, which is that crease, that should be level with the E string there. Can you see? Then you know that all of your fingers, all of your knuckles are level with the E string and all your fingers are up, well up above the fingerboard. You can probably see that from this end a bit better. You see, all of my fingers are up above the fingerboard. What I see is this quite a lot. And then you're naturally playing flat as well because your fingers are simply too low. Can you see my knuckle, knuckles here are way down below that level of the fingerboard. That's about this bit too low, isn't it, that much? So see if you can start with that finger line and have your finger line level with the E string, okay? Let's see if that helps. Let me know in one of the comments below any video if that helps. Um, let me see. How do you know exactly where the frets are? Thank you for that question. And uh, that is a very useful question as well, uh, because sadly for violinists, we haven't got frets like uh, guitarists, isn't it? And we learn by sound, therefore. Now, 
some methods for beginners use stickers and you may have seen violins with lots of stickers on dots where your fingers should go personally i don't quite believe in that because it is a short-term solution to an issue that you need to address right away is that you want to hear where the sounds are and you want to start singing the sounds in your head now of course we can all play uh, we can all sing da, 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 like that. And once you get used to singing these notes in your head while you play, you will learn where, learn to hear where the frets are. So that when you start to play up in positions, you can hear it. We know the distance. Da, 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 da. You go like that in the positions. Da, 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 da. Like that, you see? So violinists have to go the extra mile of singing in their heads compared with guitarists. They can just see. And I see lots of guitarists who've got little tipex dots here so that you can see where your fingers go. Uh, violinists need to know where it is. It's not only that, though, because you develop a muscle memory as well of where your different notes are. So combined the combined method of the muscle memory of where your fingers are always falling down and you're singing in your head that will make you work out where the correct notes are i hope that answered your question it's it's a really good one and one that i come across quite a lot so you sing the note in your head and i was just um recording my new course the creek Bell method course um where you hear me sing quite a lot and it's it's not fantastic singing i'm not a singer but so long as i know how you can imagine the next note in your head that is what we need so another question has just come in you're great asking all these lovely questions my left thumb sometimes hurts when playing. I don't know what I do change, but at some point it doesn't hurt anymore. And then when it starts hurting again, why is it happening and how to fix it? Yes, a very common thing as well to happen, that your thumb hurts when you play. Now, it would be interesting to find out if your thumb hurts when you play just open strings. Because I imagine it may not hurt. And this might be a moment when your thumb stops hurting, is you have you happen to play a couple of open strings. Because what a lot of people do is when they put a finger down on the string, and I can probably show it best to you here, as a result of pressing your finger down, your thumb also starts to press. And you can see maybe here, and you can suddenly feel it here in your hand, there, that, that sometimes feels really, really hard. And that means you're very, very tight in your muscles, just here in the mouth of your hand. It means that you're pressing a little bit too much with your thumb. Now, it would be easy for me to say, don't press quite so hard on your thumb. Um, and that is not so easy not to do. <laughs> uh, we've all been there and we've all pressed way too hard with our thumb. If I look through my own beginner's books, it says no muscle power all the time. My teacher used to write it in there. So we've all come across this at some point that this needs to be really loose. Now, a good exercise for you to do is when you play your normal music, your normal pieces that you play, and then after each bar, just take a little break and tap your thumb just to make sure that it's nice and loose. And you will find when you start practicing this first, it's very difficult to stop and think, oh, oh yes, that's what's loose is. But when you do that over time and you practice that for two weeks or three weeks in a row, you think, ah, actually, the natural tension in my finger is a little bit less or the natural tension in your thumb is a little bit less. So once you've got into that habit of tightening your thumb, uh, it takes a while to get rid of it again. So this is not an instant fix. But once you keep going and keep practicing, keep checking that that is loose and practicing lots of open strings while you do this, maybe with your thumb, so that you get rid of that connection that whenever I play, I need to power through my thumb as well. That would help you, I think. I hope that answers your question. Is there anyone who's got another question? Now is your chance. <laughs> 
Oh, hello from Ghana. Oh, that's really nice to hear that there's somebody here from Ghana. Hello, Priscilla. Lovely to see you here. <laughs> okay. Okay, somebody else says thank you so much. I will try that. This is a person who asked about the thumb. Good luck with your thumb practice. <laughs> Where else is everyone from then? Have we got other African countries joining us today? Have we got any people from Asia joining us today? Have we got any Americans joining us today? It's always really nice for me to see where people are from because I've been quite surprised in the past that people from all over the world, Egypt, Canada, Lithuania, oh, it's absolutely lovely. You see, that's, I, I find that still mind-boggling that we can connect over the internet. Massachusetts, USA, welcome everyone. <laughs> it's a bit strange to do that halfway through a lesson, but there you go. It's just really nice for me to see and for others as well. Did you have any advice about maintaining a straight bow without a mirror? Uh, and can maintain a straight bow? But start to lose it once I look away. Yeah, that's that's a very common thing. So the question is, when I have a mirror and I play with my bow and I can work at it so that it becomes straight, as soon as I take the mirror away, I can't remember where straight is. Now that is that is a a good one because it happens to lots of people um, and what you want to do is use your mirror first and then start to bow and look in your mirror until you're perfectly straight and you can actually also ask another person if you want to do that if you have somebody around who uh, wants to help you and then when you're in your mirror watching you straight make sure that you're perfectly straight then close your eyes and feel what that feels like and then look in your mirror again to see if you're still as straight as you thought you were. Because what we want to do is come away from the visual, but start to feel where straight is. Now, straight is always in front, isn't it? Straight is never sideways with your bow arm. So I think you've already worked that out. So the next step, once you are straight and you look in your mirror, keep your mirror there, close your eyes and see if you can get the feel. What does that feel like? Where is my upper arm? Where's my forearm? Open your eyes again, check that it's still straight and then have another practice. Close your eyes again and think, am I still straight? Does that feel the same as the previous time I was practicing with my eyes closed? And this way you can make little tweaks and again, this is one of those things where on the violin we need to take the long view. This is not a quick fix because if you've played with your bow at an angle for any length of time, your muscle memory will think that is the right way, you see. So practice it with your eyes closed in front of a mirror a couple of times each day for the next three weeks or so. And hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, it will improve. But this is, again, a process rather than an end result. OK, so the longer you've played at an angle, the longer it takes to fix it. OK, but you might enjoy the process in the meantime. Oh, lovely. Somebody's here from Trinidad and Tobago. Well done. It's just lovely to see where everyone's for, is from. So we've got people here from America, Canada, Africa. Trinidad and Tobago, Egypt, Lithuania. So I think we've covered more or less every continent. Now, I'm trying to do these live classes at different times in the day because I got a message from somebody um, yesterday, I think. I'm in America and it's 7 o'clock in the morning when you do your class. Actually, in previous classes, there was somebody from America who got up at five o'clock to, to meet this class. So um, I, I tend to vary them a little bit so that people in different continents can, can access it. So come back another time if you find it too early this time, okay. Have we got any more questions? Oh, 
Thank you, Deborah, for this next question. I assume that everyone else can see the chat box as well. So Deborah has just asked this question. Does the weather affect the sound of the violin? Yes, it does. Uh, if you are living in a very dry climate um, compared with a very humid climate, it doesn't matter. You can have the violin in different countries so long as that humidity states stays more or less the same now i get lots of uh, tuning issues with my pupils violins when the seasons change so when there's more rain or when it suddenly gets very dry when it gets very frosty or in the middle of summer and it doesn't rain too much you need to tune your violin more so yes the violin is a natural product and it goes with the humidity in the air now so I've, I've traveled uh, the world with my violin, so I've been in very hot countries. Once it settles, um, the violin's fine, but it's the transition between dampness and drier air that affects the violin. I wouldn't say it would affect, once it gets used to the different types of weather, it doesn't affect the sound so much, at least not in my experience, that your sound will be warmer or icier when it's a different humidity. But there is definitely some time that your instrument needs to adapt to the different conditions. But I wouldn't say your violin sounds better in warmer climates or in more damp environments. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we say don't leave your violin in a hot car. If the sun's burning on the boot of your car and you leave your violin in the boot, please don't. Uh, or if you are at home and you have your radiators on in winter, do not sit your violin case right next to it, but a little bit away. And it's common sense, you know, if you find an area too cold to be in yourself as a person, it's probably too cold for the violin or too hot for the violin. You don't want to be in the burning sun at all the time and neither does your violin. So keep it in its case to protect it, to protect it first of all, but don't put it near a radiator or in a very hot car. Ah, and there's an, another question here from the Philippines. Lovely, welcome Philippines. I may have a silly, not, not a silly, there isn't a silly question. So <laughs> please let me put that one to bed straight away. Uh, is there a normal vibrato sound? Um, that is a very good question because um, once you have, of course, when you start learning to play the vibrato, you get a big, I'm hoping that you get a big vibrato. So I would always start teaching vibrato hugely big. OK, when you look at the television and you see people playing in concerts that are very, very advanced players, it might sometimes go really, really fast. Now, vibrato always should fit the style of your music. So if you play a piece which is called lullaby, which means a nighttime song to put babies to sleep in the evening, you wouldn't play with a fierce vibrato like that because it would wake your baby up, wouldn't it? Likewise, if you play a very fast piece, a very, very energetic piece, a slow vibrato doesn't match it because it doesn't fit the style of the music at all. So there isn't a normal vibrato. Um, there is a vibrato that you can go to as your default vibrato, if you like, which fits most of the moderately fast pieces. But then your vibrato should speed up a little bit when you play fast sections or slow down when you play softer music or more gentle uh, moods of music, you see? So the style of the vibrato should fit the style of the piece. Then again, there are people who say, oh, I play Baroque music and I play Baroque pieces only on the Baroque violin, so I'm not playing vibrato at all. That is a line of thought. I have to admit straight away that I would like to pretend that my violin is, is a bit more modern and I play sort of also Baroque pieces as well as more classical and romantic style pieces. So I'm perhaps a bit more cautious with my vibrato, but I'm not taking it out altogether. So there are different lines of thought where vibrato might fit, uh, but, but you want to always try and adapt your vibrato to the style of the piece that you're playing. 
Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Hello, Monique. Nice to see you here. I think we have already um, talked about your the role of your thumb in in, in vibrato playing. Um, so you might look at the beginning of this video if, uh, if you came in later. That's okay. The question is how. And let me just uh, see the question. How can you get your thumb to stop moving too much to, during vibrato? Now, when you first learn vibrato, you're so focused on your fingers that your thumb might be here and moving along. When you learn to play vibrato a little bit longer, your thumb might actually make some contact with the neck of the violin and may still, still move. And when you're a little bit further advanced and your arm muscles are a little bit stronger, so that you are a bit more independent with your thumb and your fingers, your thumb might actually stay there. Again, it's staying there very loosely. I could easily move it up and down like that, okay? It's not squeezing, and that is why it's okay to move your thumb up and down in the initial stages of vibrato, because then I can be sure that you're not gripping your thumb, you see? But as you progress and your arm muscles, especially the muscles in your upper arm here, get stronger and get more control over your vibrato, then try to just softly touch the neck of your violin here. Let it move maybe gently, because that in itself is a very strained position for your thumb as well, because look at my index finger, it strains as a result of my thumb being away, you see? So you want to ideally come to that position with your thumb at some point. Initially it might move, and then it might stay there. But wind this video back once it's on the channel, it will stay here all the time on this channel and you can look at it from the beginning and that's where I've gone in a little bit more detail. Here's another good question. My left hand always slips gradually after a few minutes so I lose the finger position. That happens to a lot of people. So thank you for asking this question and I'm sure there will be others here who find the same thing. And that is to do with... Um, your arm getting a little bit tired. And I think that most commonly when people play, they gradually slip up because your arm comes this way a little bit. So you might say to yourself, go back, go back, let's try again. And you might even find pieces where you can consciously encourage your hand to go back, which will then in effect be that it stays in the same place because your hand wants to come this way. You encourage your hand to go back, away from your face, shall we say. And if you encourage it all the time to go there, then it will be eventually be staying there. But this, again, like I've said so many times this morning, uh, after so many questions, it's a process. Violin playing, is, you never get instant results, which for me is part of the charm of it, because you have to really get down to working out why it is that your hand will want to, sh to, to come up. It's, in my view, it's just getting tired, so I encourage you to go back. And today or tomorrow, you might not find a, not see a result straight away, but after three weeks, you might suddenly think, ah, did I slip up less just today? And that's where you can see your, um, your progress, you see. So be very patient with yourself. If you find you're sliding up, say, come on, go back. Go back, let's see. Let's see if it wants to stay there. Uh, what you don't want is get stressed about it because then you start to press harder and you get more, more tension in your arm and that will allow you to, to um, slip up even more. Okay? So as with every technique in violin playing, when you get upset or angry or cross, it is so counterproductive. And I was just saying and <laughs> telling one of my pupils yesterday who got very, very um, angry with himself. Uh, it happened to me all the time as well. When I was an, a music student at the Rotterdam Conservatoire, I have been sent home by my teacher because I was stamping my feet and, and getting very, very upset and cross with myself. And my teacher was quite right to say, this is so counterproductive, go home, do something different, then come back to it when you're in a better mood. So if you get cross with yourself, whether this is about vibrato or about finger, your finger slipping up or your bone not being straight, come away from it. 
and try again at another another day because you need patience and you don't need aggravation, you see. I hope that's answered your question. How do you tune your violin is the next question. And that is also a very useful question. And I'm sure that lots of people um, have come across at some point. Um, but I'll just briefly go into this because this is a complicated one. Uh, and I might refer you to my video tuning a violin. Okay, go in the channel and use the search um, icon, how to tune a violin. You have a whole video about tuning violin. But I'll briefly tell you, um, when your strings are completely loose or completely out of tune, you use these pegs, uh, and they are the E string and the A string and the D string and the G string. Now, you can use different devices. You can use a tuning app. Uh, which you can download free from the App Store, uh, which gives you the notes, the correct notes for G, D, A, and E. You can also get a little tuning device. I've forgotten the name now, which you can get from Amazon or any 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 shop, music shop, and it has a little light. So when you pluck your strings like that, it gives you a green or red light, which tells you uh, your string is in tune or out of tune, and it will also tell you. Uh, your string is too low or too high, so that would be great help, I think. And then once you're almost in tune, you might have some fine tuners, some adjusters here with which you can fine tune your violin. So this is only for very, very small distances in change, in tuning. Whenever your violin's completely out of tune, you need to use the big pegs. But, big but, um, is that if you turn these pegs, they are always a bit sticky before they move. So I would suggest you, when you tune your violin, always to loosen this peg first before you tighten it, because you wouldn't be the first person that tightened it straight away, and it would go way too fast, way too far, and snap the string. So there's a little word of advice, always to loosen the pegs first when you're tuning with them. But use a tuning device like an app or uh, pitch pipes, or um, a little snarky, that's what it's called, snarky tuner, which has green and red lights, which might be very useful. Um, let me just go through the textbooks. Uh, how soon can I start practicing vibrato? I've been playing consistently for about four months now. And Okay, okay. Thank you, Priscilla, for your question here about how soon you can start to play vibrato. Um, there is a great variation in when people can start to play with vibrato. Um, what I'm looking for when I suggest people can start to learn with vibrato is general relaxation. If you find yourself playing with a lot of tension in your hand here and in your fingers, it is too early to start vibrato and it simply won't come. You can try it but you won't be able to do it because you need to get a, a certain level of relaxation, which is very hard to quantify and say you can do this after three months or after four months. It's impossible because people have different natural muscle tones. Okay, so it depends on some people, like these snake people, they can put their legs in <laughs> behind their heads and other people are really, really stiff like me and I can't even bend my wrist as far, whereas other people can go all the way back, you know, these children's games that you can put your thumb against there. So it will take longer for me to learn vibrato than somebody who's natural, very, naturally very supple, okay? Uh, but if you can play perfectly in tune, that's another aspect to playing with vibrato because you're going to vary the tuning. So you need to know where perfect tuning is before you can then start to alter your tuning. Okay. Um, so that is another aspect, being very be, being relaxed enough and then having perfect tuning when you play without vibrato. Those are two crucial elements. Uh, but you can try it. And there are some nice vibrato videos, how to learn to play vibrato on my channel. So go and find them there. If you if you search for vibrato videos, you can find it. Um, uh, but if you if you uh, are a beginner and it's too soon, you can't do that. You see, you want to be able to do that. 
as well as your first exercise. If this is really difficult to do, then come away from it and leave it another three months or six months and suddenly you find yourself playing with vibrato. And if it's too soon for learning to play with vibrato, it will simply not appear. And you can get very angry or very cross or very disappointed, but it won't come because your body isn't ready to play with vibrato, you see. So four months, in my view, is quite early on. But then again, who knows? <laughs> you might be able to do it. So find the vibrato video and practice with that. Okay, here's another. Um, let me see. <laughs> oh, there's a whole lot of questions now that I shall answer. And then we're sort of coming to the end of this um, of this free class. Okay, I, I will do them again in, in the near future. So keep keep uh, keep an eye out on, on this channel, as I think most of you will be anyway. Um, so the question is... Um, what is the right amount of pressure on the string? That is a super question as well. Thank you, Deborah, for asking that question. Um, you can put more pressure on the string when you've got more speed. And what is right depends on other variables, you see. And that is why some people find it so difficult to get the pressure right, because the pressure depends on the speed of your bow. So if your bow goes very slow, your pressure should be much lighter than when your bow goes very fast. The string can have much more pressure when the bow moves very fast, okay? And it's that balance of pressure and speed that is very nice to experiment with, actually, to see when you like the sound that comes out the best. So you might try with a very light and very slow bow and gradually increase the speed and increase the weight until you think, oh, this is a nice sound, and my violin's really enjoying this. It's beginning to sing. However, if your speed is too slow and your pressure comparatively too strong, too much pressure in the bow, it won't sing as freely. You get a sort of compressed sound, a little bit of a screechy sound, maybe if, you, if it's way too much pressure. So every violin always also has that sort of sweet spot where that violin really likes the amount of pressure compared with the speed of the bone. But that exercise that I've just explained um, is probably very helpful so that you can experiment with your bow and your violin mm. where the violin likes it the best. Okay, I hope that answered your question. So if you are enjoying these questions, do please consider supporting this channel so I can keep on making these videos. And thank you for all these lovely comments that you have just written. By far the best channel ever. I'm trying to teach my best always in everyday life, but also on my YouTube videos. And luckily, I have got lots of interesting pupils who allow me to learn from what works and what doesn't work you see so you are the beneficiary of that so i say it again and you can find it in the channel banner art at the top of the channel uh, a support button info at proamstrings.com on paypal you can support me and so i can make more videos lovely let me see if there are other good questions here Am I, <laughs> I, this question is, is a good one as well. I find your Suzuki method violin lessons very helpful. Are, are you planning to do volume three in the future? I would hope so, but not in the near future. Um, so by, I'll tell you why that is as well. It's not me being nasty or anything. There is a lot that I want to do still on this channel. Um, but the vast majority of my students, first of all, are, the ones that are just starting or have just started and um, they benefit more from more beginner videos. That's one reason. And next reason is that once you get to finish book two, you are becoming a really, really good player already. And you might need some individual input and to, to go 
to an even higher level, you want to have some very structured um, teaching. So I would suggest by that level, you get a teacher to to really help you fine tune all the techniques. Because obviously when you learn from a video, there is a sort of a gross average that most people will benefit from, but uh, you need that uh, bespoke input that helps you get as far as you can get with your individual ability, you see? So that is another reason why I'm. you will find mostly beginner videos on my channel or intermediate ones, but not much more above that because you need that individual input to get the most out of your playing and to reach the highest level that you as an individual can reach, you see. And that is the ultimate aim, of course, for every teacher is to get the most out of this particular pupil and make them go as far as they can possibly get. So by that time, you've reached the end of book two in the Suzuki book. Super, super um, level of playing, but you want to gain that little bit more personalized input. Okay, let me see. Someone else uh, asked this question, and that is a myth, actually. Uh, is it right that it is is the Suzuki method only for children beginners, but not for adult beginners? Uh, well, <laughs> if you ask 10 different people, you probably get 10 different opinions. In my view, no, that is not the case. Uh, any method is as good as it's being taught to whoever is trying to use that method. So, no, the Suzuki method is a very specific method in that it use, uses um, the relationship between mother and child so the child learns or the father and the child from a parent let's let's put it that way and this is how mr suzuki initiated the suzuki method that's the underlying philosophy if you like uh, but that's not to say that you can't use it in a slightly different way and it make it suitable for adults which is what i've tried to do here so no i would put that myth to bed although it was perhaps originally intended to be used by a parent together with the child. All right, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you for all these lovely, lovely comments and for, for coming to this channel for this chat. I really enjoy, as I've said in previous live classes, I really enjoy getting to meet you all and to find out where everyone is. But we're going to round off today. And uh, if you subscribe to the channel, you will get an automated message whenever I'll do a new class again. So thank you very much for joining me here today. And I very much look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks again. Bye.